My name is Cody. I get to be one of the pastors here, and we are so glad that you are here with us today. Um, Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. I'm going to pray for this, or I'm going to read it. I'm going to pray over us, and then I'll let you have a seat, and then we'll dive into explaining what's going on here in the text. So here we go. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution, meaning of food. Number, verse number two. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man of a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. So that's where Santa Claus is in the Bible, right there, okay? Um, verse 6. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the result of this is verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, we thank you for um, your word, that it does not just um, paint good pictures of things that you're honest in your word about problems um, in your church. And God, I pray that we would learn from the early church and how they solved this problem. Um, and God, that we would seek to put those same type of principles in our life so that the word of God can continue to increase, so that Jesus can be made famous, so that the gospel could continue to go forth. Lord, may we learn from our ancestors in the faith. Would you do that for us today? Would you humble our hearts? Would you give us boldness to confront where we need to confront, humility to listen what we need to listen to, and Lord, would you give us love and grace and mercy for all of the in-between parts? In your good name we pray, amen. You may be seated again. If you're new, welcome to the table. We are so glad that you are here today. Um, we've got it kind of darkened a little bit here today, so um, you're going to have to be dependent upon the screens for, for reading the Word. I see like a group of youth right over here together, so we're loving that, loving like the cohesion going on there. Um, anyway, um, hopefully today this side of the room will have to get up and go over to the cooler um, like we did last week. We had people like literally going home sick to their stomach because it was so hot last week, but um, we're really, really glad. Um, we're really thankful for the school um, just being diligent and working on this, and specifically, there was a guy, I met the guy who actually fixed the air conditioners. That guy's name is, guess what? His name is Cody. Not me, a different Cody, but anyway, thank the Lord for Cody's, right? Um, good good HVAC tech. We're so glad that that guy um, was, was able to fix these things. I think one of them like a new unit, and we're Totally jazzed about that. So anyway, um, let's go ahead and kind of recap where we've been. We've been going through the book of Acts. So at the end of the Gospels, Jesus dies, is buried, rises again, and he is spending some time with his disciples. The book of Acts begins with Jesus ascending and going into heaven. And he gives his disciples um, some instructions before he goes. He says, stay here in Jerusalem. Most of them were Galilean. He said, stay here in Jerusalem. Wait on the Holy Spirit that I'm going to send to you. And then you go and be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so all of those things have happened. Peter and John and the apostles are preaching and proclaiming Jesus. They're proclaiming the word. That's what it means by the word of God increasing. Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is increasing in Jerusalem. They're proclaiming him boldly, and they get arrested for it. They get beat for it. And so that's where we wound up last week, and we talked about persecution, that we're supposed to proclaim the gospel even in the face of um, opposition in the face of rejection and even in the case of persecution 
We learned last week that most of us probably haven't been persecuted, but it's normal for a Christian to be opposed or to be rejected or to even be persecuted for proclamation of the gospel. That's what we sign up for when we become Christians. If Jesus was opposed, we're going to be opposed. If Jesus was rejected, we're going to be rejected. If Jesus was persecuted, killed, we should not think it strange when we are persecuted. Okay? So that's what's happened. So that's where we have like these forces outside of the church warring against the church and wanting to shut the church down. Now here's what you need to know. That's been going on all over the globe for 2,000 years and they haven't stopped the church. The church is still marching forward. It's still going forward. It's not perfect. Sometimes they get. Sometimes it's really, really hard. It, sometimes the church gets planted, and sometimes it, it 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 takes root in places where it is really, really difficult. And it takes years and years and years. Nations like Iraq, where for years it they, it was against the law, it was illegal, and it still is to become a Christian, to convert from Islam to Christianity. They'll kill you for it, like like that. But also, we know that today in Iraq, the, 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 the mosques are empty. And there are mass baptisms where thousands and thousands of people are c- turning to Christ because of the faithfulness of a few missionaries that were opposed, that were rejected, were persecuted, and they did that. And they, so the church marches on. I'm painting you all that picture to say opposition from without cannot stop the church. However... Problems inside the church, if not dealt with, can shut a church down just like that. And I can't snap with my left hand, but I can with this one. So, okay. And I also, I snap with the weird finger. I snap with that one, not that one. Weird. All right. Talk to me about it later on. I hope that's not a divisive issue for you. I hope that that doesn't. I hope I'm not a second class Christian because I snap with a weird finger. Um, anyway. So, all this to say is. Problems inside the church are inevitable. The, you're sitting around people who are fallen, who are broken. You're sitting next to people that if you knew their past, you would probably be shocked. We're broken people. We have problems. And we don't just come out of those. Problems in the church are inevitable because fallen people in the church is inevitable. It's just a given. However, problems in the church must not take us off of mission. And we see this here in this passage where that, there was a problem. It was a legitimate problem. There were some hard feelings. And yet, the wisdom that they handled it is it's awesome. It, it's just it's beautiful how they, work, how they navigated through this. And I think that these are things that we should learn from. Okay, So let's go ahead and look at the problem. Verse one, it, it's, the problem is addressed in one verse. It, it, it's summed up in one verse. The church had had massive expansion. 3,000 people were added to their number. Another time Peter preaches, now the number comes to 5,000. Some say it may be another 5,000. So the number of believers somewhere is between five and 8,000 people that have become believers. Now, probably not all of them have stayed in Jerusalem, but a number of them had. And so this church that was about 120 people, smaller than what we have here in this gathered upper room, has now swelled to probably 2,000, 3,000, maybe as many as 5,000 people. And peop, now they're, and they have no systems. They didn't have breeze to like manage their membership. They didn't have like they didn't have any sound equipment. They didn't like, they just didn't have anything like that. And they're just so they're scrambling trying to figure out. And the apostles are just keeping they're they're keeping on preaching. You know, I'm sure they probably had some people in the church saying, "Hey, could y'all just like not preach for a week? Let us manage what we got. But y'all keep preaching. There's no people added, and we're just complicating the problems. Why don't y'all just slow down a little bit, right? You know, no, they didn't do that because they weren't Baptists. So you know, they had all you know, they they just they just kept growing. But in this problems that they had, in the, in the problem that they had, you have people from multiple cultures. Now, here's what you need to understand. It mentions these two words, Hellenists and Hebrews. And you need to understand that that means, that signals, a language barrier. They were all from a Jewish background, but some of them had come from outside and they spoke Greek. They didn't speak Aramaic. Those were the Hellenists. Okay? The Hebrews, they spoke Aramaic as their primary tongue. 
So there's two languages. And because of this language barrier, and I'm sure that there were some other cultural barriers there as well, but because of these barriers, the Hellenist, the Hellenistic Greek-speaking widows are being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Now, you understand, have to understand about widows in that day. They didn't have Social Security. They didn't have any kind of government programs. Rome didn't have like a program to feed widows. There was nothing like that. They were dependent upon their family or upon the charity and goodwill of their neighbors or other people around them. It was all running on the rails of relationship. So now this movement comes in. People are being saved. They're, they're, they're recognizing how good and decent these people are, how gracious these people are, that people are selling their homes, giving money the, from the proceeds of the home to just feed other people who didn't have, didn't have as much. And so the reputation of the church has gone out that this is a, this is a group of people who take care of one another. And then within the church, there's a group of people who aren't feeling as taken care of. You see the problem? The Hellenists spoke Greek. The Hebrews spoke Aramaic. This language barrier was creating a distribution barrier. And you say, well, how, how could that happen? They didn't have Google Translate. You can imagine if they're, if they're so used to just speaking Aramaic, and, it's, and this happens with us a lot, we just assume that, that people know our systems. We assume that people know what's going on. Think about communication. I guarantee you the biggest problem in your marriage is communication. It is in mine. I'm not trying to say it. I'm just telling you. Like, I've been married for 27 years. You would think that Lori and I got this thing figured out yet. Nope, still working on it. Still working on it. Communication is a huge problem. It's, it, it, it is the biggest issue in probably anything that you do, communication. And here it's the most fundamental level. They're not speaking the same language. So imagine you're a Hellenistic Jew. Your primary tongue is Greek. You don't speak Aramaic. And you're out there doing this. And you hear some Christians talk about, you know, speaking in, in Aramaic. And I can't speak Aramaic, so pretend that what I'm saying is Aramaic. You know, ask for the Holy Spirit to interpret this for you. But, like, and they're speaking it in Aramaic, saying, hey, the daily distribution is going to be at 5 o'clock Tuesday. And this Hellenistic Jewish widow, she's like, I don't know what they said. So she doesn't show up at 5 o'clock on Tuesday. She goes to her backgammon game, and she, does, she misses it. And then she's like, and then she, her neighbor has food, and she's like, like where would you get the food? Well, they told us to be there Tuesday at 5. I didn't hear it. And so... You know, who knows how many weeks this goes on, but it's a problem. And there's grumbling. That's literally what it means. It says a complaint, it means grumbling or murmuring. You can imagine that if you've been overlooked multiple times, you'd be a little bit frustrated about that. Now, it never says that the Jewish background believer, that the Hebrew Jews are sinning against them. I'm sure that the Hellenistic widows felt like they were getting sinned against. It never says they were being sinned against. We don't know. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. But, they, but it was a problem, and it was creating this rift. So, this report was going out to the church. There was not a needy person among them, and yet, within there, you may have had a widow that's gone a week without food. And she probably feels in need. And she probably had relatives that probably were a little bit more upset about it because that's what our tendency is. We have a tendency to take up other people's offense. And, and when, when we pick up their offense, we'll get more irate about it than they actually are. I'm just going to tell you something right now. Just this is, uh, if it's okay to, to want to do justice to, for other people and, and help out other people, but don't get offended on behalf of another person. Because the grace that God promises to give them to deal with their offense, He didn't promise that for the person who just goes over there and picks it up. Be, be, be careful about that. Be careful about that. So they're being overlooked. It's a major problem. The most vulnerable in the community, who are the widows, that have no one else to look out for them, they're suffering. 
The reputation of the church is at stake. Thus, the reputation of Jesus is at stake. So the problem had to be addressed. Here's the thing. I want you to, here's the takeaway. Address big problems. Now, the question is deciding what's a big problem, right? What's a big problem? What's a small problem? There are some problems that get addressed you can just let roll off your back. There are some problems that arrive, er, er, arise in your household, at your work and stuff, that that's just somebody blowing off steam. You can just ignore that, and it's probably just going to go away. But there are other problems that you just can't ignore. You have to address these. Address the big problems. Don't, and th- so that's for you as a leader. Also, if you're the one that's suffering this, don't suffer in silence. Don't suffer in silence needlessly. You can bring things forward, okay? We must, but here, but regardless of where we're at, whether we're the one that has to address the problem, whether the ones want to have to bring up the problem, we cannot let the problem take us off of mission, which brings us to the solution proposed by the apostles. They proposed a solution where they weren't the solution. And I think that's genius. They proposed a solution without being the solution. They didn't make it about them. Now, I know a lot of people look at that and they say, well, yeah, they did. They said it's not good for us to take up serving tables and neglect prayer and word of God. Well, think about what you've heard in the first five chapters of the book of Acts. It's the proclamation of the word. It's going out. It's going out. It's going out. That's where God is working. Do you think it would have been God's will for them to stop proclaiming the word of God to deal with this? No. And there's good evidence to, there's really good evidence scripturally to say that like he wasn't just performing these miracles through just anybody willy-nilly in the church. He was doing it through the apostles during the proclamation of the word. Which you have to understand, most of these apostles they're not, they're not, they weren't raised as Pharisees. They don't know the word of God like a lot of their contemporaries do. They're having to reinterpret all that. And even if they did know the word of God, they're having to go back into the Old Testament scriptures and search that and see that and like, oh, that's where Jesus was. Oh, that was about Christ. Oh, that was about the Messiah. Oh, they're, they're seeing everything through that. So they're spending copious amounts of time studying and relearning the Old Testament scriptures in light of that, and then so they can show people who Jesus is. And it wouldn't have been good for them to neglect that. There was a priority. There were things that they were gifted to do and called to do that only they could do. And they needed to do what only they were called to do and what only they were gifted to do. And it's the same way with you. But that doesn't mean that the widows have to be neglected. Why? Because the church, get this, hear this, the church is bigger than its leaders. It's bigger than its leaders. The twelve summoned the whole number of disciples together, which, by the way, we're congregational in how we vote. We're going to vote here in just a few, uh, well, next week, as a matter of fact, on our next elder. And the membership of this church will vote on that. It's not just Dan and I as the elders saying, David is going to be our next elder. See, that's elder rule polity, and that's not how we operate. And it's not how they operated here. The 12 apostles had much more authority than what Dan and I have, and yet, even with that authority, they gathered the whole number of disciples together, pitched them their idea, and the whole whole crowd said, that makes sense. And they, they, now it doesn't say how they voted or anything like that, but there is, the, there is this incipient idea, this kernel of congregationalism that God, through his church, that God gives ownership not just to the leaders of the church. That type of mentality, that comes from Roman Catholicism and papal edicts. Like the Pope is God's representative on earth. And that's not how we do things. We believe in a doctrine called priesthood of the believer. That Jesus is every believer's priest. And we don't have to go through another person to receive like forgiveness of our sins. And because every person also 
can go through Jesus, that means that that person, the Holy Spirit, lives within them. And because the Holy Spirit who lives within them also lives within us, he can speak to them the same way he speaks to us. And therefore, we have ownership and we have buy-in to the whole church. This is why we talk about church membership. We want people to have ownership and buy-in with this. That's not, we're, I'm going too far. But anyway, there, here we go. Address the big problems. Don't suffer silence. We go in, they propose a solution without being the solution. The 12 apostles pitch this idea to the full number of disciples. We are elder-led, congregationally ruled under the headship of Christ. Now, what the solution is, is they said, appoint these men. Now, some people say, these are the first deacons, and they very well may be, although the word deacon is not really mentioned there as in an, in an office. The only time it's mentioned is when the apostles say, we shall not do this in order to serve tables. And it's mentioned as a verb. And it literally means diakon, to serve, to wait on a table. Here's the application I think that we can take from this and put this into our lives and put it into every aspect in our lives. You don't have to do everything that you're asked to do. Are you hearing me? I know some of y'all are mothers of small children. And you're like, Cody, I just can't even relate to that. I just can't, I can't, I can't relate to it. One day you will. Hang on, sister. Hang on. Okay? But you don't have to do everything that you're asked. There are some things that you have to say no to. There's a book, I think it's by William Urey, it's called The Power of a Positive No. And um, it just talks about the freedom that comes in that. Like, there are some things you've got to say no to. Here's the thing, though. Your no must be rooted in a deeper yes. And that's exactly what's going on with the apostles. The apostles, they didn't say no, but they basically said, we can't, do, we, we can't take off what we're doing here to go daily distribute food. We can't do that. Matter of fact, not all of us even speak Greek. Let's look at the larger congregation to see where there's a bigger solution here. And what's interesting is all of the guys that they listed to come do this you know what they all those names greek meaning that they all spoke greek as their primary language and probably inferring that they also spoke aramaic and even if they didn't speak aramaic they were okay because they knew that the aramaic jews are still going to be taken care of there's already like communication pipelines and things in place but they said, we got to shore up this one area here. we got to make sure that we can communicate to that. So we're going to take and get some Greek-speaking men that are good men and full of the Holy Spirit and, and willing to serve. And that's what they did. So what they basically did was they delegated it. And this is the basis of me saying, you don't have to do everything that you're asked. You can either delegate it, and ask someone else to do it, the way that this would look with um, the way it looked this past week in our home. We got to babysit the Reese girls for a few hours, and we were cooking macaroni and cheese, and I could have very easily cooked the macaroni and cheese on my own, but I'm like, I'm going to ask Adeline if she's ever cooked macaroni and cheese, and to which she said no. I don't know if she has or not, but she said no. I said come over here we're going to show you how to cook macaroni and cheese and so we did that at noon and then later on that day I had her go smoke a brisket for me and I didn't even watch no I'm just joking I didn't do that I'm, but but that's you train them you train them you delegate you help okay you stir this okay you pour in this all right you pour in the milk all right put this pat of butter in there stir that around okay we get all that stuff in there and what's amazing about that is at least how it worked with little like little kids like like she was doing this well what happens with little sister she she goes i want to do something i want to do like now you have people standing in line waiting to do some of the things that you've delegated other people to do okay you can delegate it here's another option you can automate it we lived in a we, we live in a technologically advanced area or time we we can we can automate things there are things that we can do that we can just put into a system where they're automatic. We don't have to worry about it. It just gets done. We can do that. The last option is you can eliminate it. Okay? They couldn't eliminate the widows. That's not an option. Okay? 
<laughs> they, they couldn't automate the widows. They could delegate the task to some other people so that the widows are taken care of. Delegate it, automate it, or eliminate it. They chose delegation. It's the only option that they had at that time. So, but here's what you need to know. The apostles said no to this task, delegated it, because their no was rooted in a greater yes. We must not take ourselves away from the study of the word of God and prayer. We've got to keep doing those things. Those are the places where God is working. We've got to keep doing those things. We can't allow this problem to take us off of mission. Okay? And you can't either. And that was rooted in a greater yes. Their yes was the mission. Our problems should not take us off mission. This problem did not take the apostles off of their mission. We should learn from that. What was the result? What was the result of the apostles' undeterred commitment to prayer and the word of God and delegation of ministry to other people? What happened as a result of this decision and these principles that they lived out? What happened? Verse 7. The word of God continued to increase. Pause. Had they not made that decision, had they stepped back from study of the word of God, had they stepped back from prayer, had they given themselves to the daily distribution of food, do you think verse 7 would be here in the Bible? I don't think so. I don't think that, I don't think that it would have continued to do that. He, now, God's sovereign, and he was going to have his redemptive plans, and I understand all that, but like the, the purpose of the, of the text here is to show that like because they listened to the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, because they were in prayer about it, because they were listening to God, and because they were aware that the church was bigger than just them, they were able to delegate this task, and the word of God continued to increase. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. It multiplied greatly. Probably what happened was, I mean, you can just imagine this, use our sanctified imagination. Here's this Hellenistic Jewish widow that's got family. She's been overlooked for, for a few days. She's, she's hungry. And then all of a sudden, this guy comes to her, her door that is Greek-speaking, speaking her language and says, I'm so sorry. We, we overlooked you, and here, here's some food. Now, who knows where that food come from? Maybe he took that out of his own pantry. Maybe he, find, he knew some other storage spots. Who knows where it comes from? But he gives that to her and says, let, let me pray for you. Is there anything else that you need? And then he goes on. What's going to happen? What's going to happen right there? I'll tell you what's going to happen. She's going to pull out her iPhone and get on Facebook and talk about how awesome these people are. Now, probably not getting on her iPhone, probably not getting on Facebook, but probably telling her neighbor, maybe even sharing food with her neighbor who's not maybe a believer and doesn't have this network of people caring about, and then she shares from the overflow of that, and that starts a conversation about the gospel, and next thing you know, this neighbor of hers that sees this kindness propagated by the apostles' decision and a deacon, maybe Philip, maybe Nicanor, maybe Timon, maybe St. Nicholas that comes over there and, you know, hands her this food with his sack full of toys and, you know, get and, and happen. And then this, maybe her neighbor's one of these disciples that it's talking about being greatly multiplied. That's how it worked. I mean, it, and it probably did that hundreds of times over as they were just living out this generosity, building these systems, living with, these, with intentionality, and not getting off of mission. They didn't actually... What's really crazy is they didn't get off mission, they expanded the mission. Because they were committed to it, they expanded it and got other people on board, maybe not as directly involved as what the apostles were doing with the teaching and preaching in Solomon's portico and the miracles and things like that. But guess what? People don't have to have miracles to become a Christian. They just need to see genuine care and love and that, the, that this, what their words are matching their deeds. That's what happened. So, what does it mean for the word of God continuing to increase? It means that the lordship of Jesus 
is increasing. And it's increasingly recognized. Here's what I mean by that. The Word of God continued to increase. In John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The New Testament is full of allusions that talk about Jesus being the Word of God. These guys are giving themselves to the Word of God, talking about the Old Testament Scriptures, recognizing that the Old Testament Scriptures are all pointing to the Logos, Jesus, the Word of God, the one who created everything, the one who was with God when He created everything, the one who is the incarnate Word of God. The Word took on flesh and dwelt among us. And they're preaching and proclaiming Christ, and as they're doing so, more and more people are recognizing Jesus as the Lord. Interesting thing here, and I'll, we'll wrap up with this. You don't make Jesus your Lord. He already is. He's Lord whether you recognize it or not. He's King whether you recognize He's in control or not. You simply yield to Him. As Lord. There's an interesting verse in the Bible. It talks about in, in Philippians. It says, One day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess Jesus Christ is Lord. And it's talking about even people who are not Christians. So there's one day when Jesus is going to come back, he's going to judge everything. And every knee, even those who denied his existence, will one day say, Jesus is Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that they're Christians. It just, rec- it just means that they finally recognize, oh, I've not had quite as much control as I thought I did. What I want to invite you to do today is just go ahead and give up your illusion of control. If you, if G, if you don't say that Jesus is my Lord, I want to invite you to go ahead and just acknowledge that today. Because He is. Whether you acknowledge it or not, He is. And it just means whether you're going to live in submission to Him as your Lord or whether you're going to continue on in your rebellion with Him. And your rebellion may not look like throwing stones at him. It may just look like, I'm not letting you control that. I'm not going to let you tell me how I spend my money. I'm not going to let you tell me who, who I can date, who I can't. It may be that. But Jesus is Lord. And the Word of God continue to increase. And that's what we want here in Arrowhead. We want the Word of God to continue to increase. We want the Lordship of Christ to increase we want the lordship of christ to increase in our homes i want every person in my home to acknowledge jesus as the lord i want that thing to expand i want people on my block and i got a lot of work to do but i want jesus to be recognized as lord in every home on my street every home in my subdivision Every home in my square mile. I want that. I want that. I, we had Bishwa um, here. He's a, a missionary, pastor, native, um, has planted multiple churches in Nepal. And I asked him, I said, Bishwa, do you, <laughs> this is going to trigger some of y'all, but that's all right. I said, Bishwa, you, you, your, your nation is a democracy, but it used to be a Hindu kingdom. He said, yeah, that's right. I said, you're a, you're a proclaim the gospel. I said, do you want your nation to be a Christian nation? He goes, yes. <laughs> I just absolutely, Yes. <laughs> He wanted it to be Christian. And that, so that's what we, we mean by that. The, Lord of, the, Lord, the Word of God continued to increase. The Lordship of Jesus continued to increase. And, it, and Jesus was becoming Lord and recognized and proclaimed as such in house after house after house, in neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood. That's what we want here in our area as well. And you should want that. You should want the Lordship of Jesus to increase. You should want the Word of God to increase. But in order for that to do, you're going to have to Delegate some things. You can't do everything that you're asked to do. You're gonna have to, we're going to have to delegate some things. We're going to have to recognize that some people are gifted for things that I'm not gifted for. That's what this early church did. And it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. So, I want to invite you. Um, some of y'all are new here. And so, um, kind of work through this. We're going to do most of our singing here in just a minute. Before we do... I want to invite three, three invitations, basically. Number one, if you're not a Christian, if you have stepped in here today and you're like, I'm, I'm not acknowledging Jesus as my Lord, I want to invite you to acknowledge Him as your Lord and Savior today. I want to invite you to repent of your sin, to turn from your rebellion, and just recognize how good Jesus is. He died on the cross for your sin. 
He rose from the grave for your justification. This is the message that the older apostles kept doing. I want to invite you to do that. You say, well, how do I do that? You can pray something like this right now. Jesus, I, I turn from my sin. I take you as my Lord and Savior. I want you to rule and reign over my life. Would you save me? And if you did that just now, I want to invite you here in just a moment when uh, people are coming down for communion, I want to invite you to come right over here. I'm going to be sitting right over here in this corner. And I want to invite you, if you gave your life to Jesus, if you acknowledged him as your Lord today, I want to invite you to come over there and tell me. You say, well, man, you mean you want me to get up out of my seat and come over there? Listen, you're, it's like espionage. Other people are going to be getting up out of their seat. You can just fall right in there with them. It'll be cool. Okay? And you say, I'm not ready to do that yet. You can talk to me in the lobby. You say, I don't know if I'm quite ready to do that. You can, you can fill out a Connect card. You can turn it in and say, hey, I want to get coffee with Cody. We, we can do it however way you want, but you've got to tell somebody. Okay? Number two, if you're a Christian, you're walking with the Lord, you've been baptized, you're faithfully pursuing Him, we want to invite you to take communion. And we're not, asking, we're not saying communion is for perfect people. Okay? But we invite you to come and take communion. But before you do that, ask yourself and, and spend some time with the Lord like, Lord, am I, am, am I pursuing you? Am I, am I addressing problems? Lord, are there any problems that you have with me that you want to get worked out right now? And not taking the Lord's Supper in a, in a presumptuous way. Okay? But there is also beauty in the way we take communion because it means that we're recognizing that Jesus is our Lord, that our identity is fully in Him, and the death that He died on the cross for our sin, the, 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 the substitutionary atonement that He offered, his body, his sinless life, his perfect death, now all imputed to me. I'm a Christian because of what Jesus has done, not because of what I have done. My whole life is in Christ. My life is hidden in Christ. And that's what we do when we take communion. We recognize that. We ratify the covenant. Okay? Number three. This is for all of us, regardless of whether you're a Christian or whether you're not. When we get back to our seats after communion, we're going to stand up and we're going to sing. And I want to invite you, whether you're a Christian or not, to just sing. To sing to God and tell Him who He is. Okay? It's a beautiful mark of, of movement toward God, of stepping toward God, when we sing to God the praise that is due His name. When we give to God the glory that He is so worthy of. It's a beautiful thing when we do that. And I want to invite you to do that. And when we're done singing, we'll have a couple of announcements, we'll pray, and then we'll get to get out of here. And if you need to make a step today, if you want to know more about wanting to join this church or more about what it means to become a Christian or you want to talk to someone with, about other issues, we're going to have time back there in the lobby. Please talk to us. We'd love to get to know you. And we're not afraid of your brokenness. It's one of our values. Your brokenness is one of our values. We're not afraid of you. We're not afraid of your stuff. Step into it. We're willing to help. The gospel has an answer for anything going on in this room. Okay? Let me pray for you. Invite you to take communion. If you want to become a Christian or if you did become a Christian today, please come let me know. I want to talk with you about your next steps. Jesus, would you save? Jesus, would you grow us? Jesus, would you help us to become more and more conformed to your image? Lord, may the word of God, your word, continue to increase in our lives, in our homes in our neighborhoods, in our relationships, in our land. In your good name we ask it. Amen.